And uh, this week is Born to Serve Part 2. And I'm going to finish up what I started last week. And that is where we've been using the uh, engagement ring as a way to see how God um, does things with us and how he sets us in the body. So I'd like for you, to, if you will, to turn in your Bibles and whatever you have, whatever phone, however you want to do it, to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, and then verse 4 through 18. And uh, boy, Anna, it's good to see your parents. Craig, oh man, it's great to see y'all today. I don't want to embarrass you, but man, they're good friends of ours, and we love y'all, Craig and Mary. God bless you. Amen. 1 Corinthians 12 and 1, and then verse 4 through 18. And if, you, if you've got it, uh, shout out a good Amen. Uh, and if you will, I know it's a little lengthy, but let's stand for the reading of God's word one last time, and then we'll be seated. 1 Corinthians 12, 1. Now, about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. Now, who's writing that right there? That's exactly right. The Holy Spirit, right? So Paul penned the words. The Holy Spirit is saying, we don't want you to be ignorant about these spiritual gifts. Verse 4 through 18. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but all in all of them and in every one, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, Gifts of healing by that one spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same spirit. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines. So he distributes. He gives us all gifts based on what he determines. So poke your neighbor real quick and say, hey, you got gifts from God as he determined. Verse 12, just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink, even so the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. Verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact... God has placed, everybody say placed. placed, everybody say set. set, that's really what that means in the Greek, but God has, God has placed or set the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. Boy, that's a freeing verse right there. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your presence. You are wonderful. You are marvelous. You're amazing, Lord. And now, I God, I ask you to speak through me, not one word of my own, but every word from the throne of God into our hearts. Speak to us, God. We are the sheep of your pasture, God, and we long to hear what you have to say to us today. God, let this seed be in the good soil of our hearts and grow and bear forth fruit in our lives. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. Hold your Bibles up, whatever form you have, and let's boldly declare, Father, today, this week. By your grace, I'm going to be a doer of your word and not a hearer only, deceiving my own self. Now, Lord, anoint my ears, anoint my heart, anoint my spirit, my soul, my mind, and my body to receive the truth of your word. In Christ's name I pray. Amen, amen. High five somebody and tell them you're born to serve. This series is all about us understanding the credible value that we have to God and to one another. Did you know that the guy who created and started Domino's Pizza actually sold 50% of the business when it was first started for a Volkswagen bug? How many of you would say that was a massive mistake? He clearly didn't understand the value in what he owned. He didn't understand what could become. 
to sell Domino's pizza for 50%, give 50% away for a, a used Volkswagen bug was not very smart. The question is, do you understand how much value you have to God? There's so many people that sit in the pews and they think, well, I'm just a rotten sinner. I got nothing to offer. Praise God he saved me. That's as good as it's going to get. Do you understand how much value you have? I'm afraid there are many Christians that come to church day in and day out, Sunday in and Sunday out, and year in and year out, and they view themselves like the guy who owned Domino's Pizza. Well, it ain't going to amount to much anyways, so let me just give it all away. God equates, there is a scripture here in verse 18 where it says God has placed or set us in the body as he sees fit. It's the only time in the scriptures that really uses a jeweler's term. It is a jeweler's term in setting a stone in a ring, placing it in there, setting it in there just right. And we have a picture of our engagement ring again where you can tell that that stone was set just perfectly in that engagement ring just right. And it was placed out there for everyone to see. Now, the jeweler sets the ring or places the ring in place with three specific goals in mind. Number one is to let the best light of the stone shine. Now, we spent all of our time last week on that. So just a brief recap, and then I'm going to hit the second and third reason today. And you're going to be very blessed by this. Point number one, which was last week, and that is this. God wants the best of your life to shine. God, the jeweler places that stone in that ring. In such a way so that the best light of that stone can shine. I we're having issues today with sound, but we just are. We'll get through it. Amen. The body is fit together, and members or parts in the Greek means equal parts. That means there's no big eye to use. That means you don't look on stage and say, wow, the singers have more value than me because I'm not up on the stage, or the musicians have a greater value because I don't do what they do. It is equal. We are all equal parts in the body of Christ. Somebody say a good amen. In fact, we learned last week that you have intrinsic value. The word intrinsic, not a word we use a lot in the English language, but it simply means inherit. It means belonging naturally, and it means innate. In other words, there is innate, there is natural, and there is inherent value in who you are simply because God created you. If nothing else, Jesus didn't die on the cross for junk. He didn't die on, on the cross for someone who has no value. He died on the cross for every one of us because every one of us has great value. You husbands, look over to your wives and say, hey, I got some value. Hold that, hold that hand up. Show that ring off. Say, I got some value. <laughs> you better recognize. Amen. We all have intrinsic value because God loves us. He accepts us. If God wanted someone else, you wouldn't exist. Remember Ephesians 2.10, and I'm just kind of recapping here. We are God's masterpiece. Come on, guys. Look over at your one and say, huh, I'm God's masterpiece. <laughs> come on, come on. Look over at him. I didn't see y'all do I see y'all laughing, looking at me. Ah, look over to your woman and say, I'm God's masterpiece. <laughs> The Greek word for masterpiece is poema from where we get our word poem from. Did you know what God was saying? He's saying, you're God's poem. Man, I love that. You are his masterpiece, his engagement ring. You are to be light in a dark world. Matthew 5, 14 through 16 says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light, what? Shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Someone shout amen. amen. Many years ago, back in the gold rush days in the 1800s, some guys stumbled across a, a unique stone in a creek bed in Montana. They busted it open and sure enough, there was gold in there. They looked around, and the whole creek bed was full of gold. Well, you can imagine these gold diggers, man. They're going crazy. We found it. We got gold. We got gold. We're rich. I mean, they went crazy. Well, after celebrating, they thought, well, we need to go in town and get some supplies. They decided to work a little while before they did. So they said, okay, 
We're going to swear everybody to secrecy. Nobody say a word. We're going to go in there and get our supplies. We're going to come out. Nobody will know. Be the wiser. All the gold will be ours. They went in town, and much to their dismay, hundreds of people from the town were walking behind them. One of the miners said, hey, who's shield? One of the people from the town said, nobody but your face gave it away. I wonder how many of us... see. Instead of frog face, you actually got a smile on your face. Somebody say amen. Well, the jewel sets the ring in place with three specific goals in mind, and the second one is for security or protection. Now, we would understand that, right? And that leads to point number two. God wants to protect you. So when that jeweler sets that stone in there, not only does he want the best light to shine, and if you missed last week, go back and listen to it because I briefly recap, but there's a whole message there that was very encouraging to everybody. But if you look at that, he's also going to set it in those prongs in the most secure, protective way possible, right? Ladies, how many of you want your engagement ring falling out going down to the grocery store one day? And you look down and there's a prong there and the, and the diamond's gone. Nobody wants that, right? So he puts it in there to keep it secure and to protect it. Watch this, 1 Corinthians 12, 15 through 17. We read it, but look on the screen. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? And if the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? In other words, what God is saying here is, we are secure in the kingdom of God and part of his body, and we bring great value to the table. There's a common problem in church today and among Christians and in the world, but especially even in the church, that if you don't do it like me, then it's wrong somehow. But it's not about changing who you are, but understanding who you are. You do not have to become something different to belong. You can belong here just the way you are. As a matter of fact, we almost demanded in our church to belong just like you are. Now, that doesn't mean you don't work on things that are sinful to repent and get rid of them from your life or change things that are not healthy. What it means is we want you to be you. We tend to want to work with someone that acts and thinks like we do. But if you do that, you're going to lose something of great value. You will never avoid differences. Rather, you should actually look for differences. I like it that our church staff thinks differently than I do. I like it that our elders think differently than I do. It's probably a good thing all of Keeps us good. Don't view someone else as weak because they're different. Rather, value that. Differences. I don't know. Why to give me a microphone because I, I just don't understand. And it's every time our sound man is out, we have a problem with our sound. It's so aggravating. <laughs> aggravating. I get so tired of this. Quit trying to make your children like you and how you would do things. Well, let me say that again. Quit trying to make your children like you and how you would do things. Quit trying to live vicariously through your children. Somebody say a good amen. Y'all are looking at me like I'm an alien today. Did you know the number one of adolescent rebellion is parents trying to conform? To be like us. We want them to worship the way we worship, do things the way we do them, think like we do. We want them to act like us, smell like us, be like us. We want our fish clean before we even 
catch them. But I'm here to tell you that what makes a beautiful church is the same thing that makes beautiful in the kingdom of God. And that is we all walk in with different styles, different personalities, different gifts, different abilities, different ways of looking at things. We need to not try to conform new people that walk through these doors to be just like you, your thoughts, and what you want. We need to accept the value they bring and appreciate the differences. Somebody say amen. How many, are, how many of you appreciate being accepted just the way you are? Shouldn't we do that with everybody who walks in the doors? You know, one of the greatest insecurities in life is thinking that you don't have as much value as someone else. I'm telling them heartbroken. This is, a, this is a, a greater pandemic than COVID is people in God's church thinking they don't have as much value as someone else. We all have the same intrinsic value as someone else. It may manifest in a different way, but we all have incredible value. You are all two carat diamonds to God. We all are. The problem is many in the church come and they worship God and they throw their diamond in a drawer somewhere and it's never to be seen. But God says, I want your light to shine. I want everywhere you go when you leave a grocery store, rather than you being a gold miner and people following you for gold, people are walking out of the grocery store saying, I don't know what you've got, but I can see something in your life is different and I need it. Some workmates at work saying, hey, I don't know what the deal is, but I need what you've got. Some family members that say, I got to have what you have. I can see it on your face. I can see it in your life. You are different than I am. I want what you have. Somebody say amen. Our security is found in Christ alone. Our security is not found in what you do or what someone says about you. We cannot complete our assignment alone, folks. We were created to be interdependent and not independent. We need one another. Allowing God to set us in the body where he sees fit gives us personal security. And there are two forms of isolation. I need you to hear this. When people begin to isolate themselves, the devil's beating them down and they've lost their sense of value and what they bring to the table. The first sign is physical signs. You've seen it, withdrawal, closed doors, closed walls, non-engagement in relationship. They put walls up not to let anybody in. Run for the doors as, as soon as church is over so they don't have to deal with anybody. I had a lady one time, she came to me, she said, Pastor, I'm, I'm leaving the church. I thought, well, okay, why? She said, well, nobody talks to me. It's the unfriendliest church I've ever been to. And I thought, that's the first time I've heard that. Everybody who visits says it's the friendliest church we've ever been to. So I said, well, I will we'll miss you. I mean, I, I'd like to change it if we can. So I started thinking in my mind, well, why is it this way to this lady and not everybody else? And then it dawned on me. I started noticing, well, she comes in 10 minutes late to church when worship's already started. And as soon as we make an altar call before you can even get people to an altar, she's out the doors. So I called her up and I said, hey, I said, I think I know why nobody's talking to you and why you're the, we're the unfriendliest church in town. She said, oh, that'd be great. I'd love to hear it. I said, well, you come in 10 minutes after everybody's worshiping and you leave before we even start the altar call. I said, I've got a question for you. How's anybody supposed to talk to you and worship God at the same time? And I said, and frankly, I said, you'd probably have 100 people talk to you after church, but you run for the doors and all we see is the smoke from your tailpipe while people are still praying at the altar. I said, I got news for you. I said, you may leave, but guess what? If you, if you maintain the same behavior, you're going to go to the next unfriendliest church in town you ever met. And ain't nobody going to talk to you neither there, neither there until you start coming early and greeting people and staying late and maybe go to dinner with somebody. Guess what? Ain't nobody going to talk to you. Is it hard to preach like this? Is it hard to have a reality check? The second form is emotional signs. Lack of expression, people that are there physically, but they're not engaged. Apathy, everything's exaggerated. You ever been there? How many would be honest and say, man, sometimes you just get to a place, everything gets exaggerated. Antagonistic, critical spirit, judgmental, 
I want to tell you, we want to help you discover the God, the gifts God has given you. You have incredible intrinsic value. That's why connecting point is so important. We want to help you with that. Small groups, you find out what you're good at. Look, there's a place for you in the kingdom of God right here if you don't already have a church. Mark 12, 30 through 31 says it this way. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do you know why there's so many church people who do not really love other people? It's because they don't love themselves. They look in the mirror and they look down. They look in the mirror and they say, I'm a failure. They look in the mirror and they say, I got nothing to offer. They look in the mirror and they say, man, I just, I just... I, I, man, I've just been beat down in life. I've been abused by people. It's obvious I'm a nobody. And then they don't love themselves, so how can they love anybody else? If we're really going to love other people as God said to, you need to hear me. You've got to start loving yourself. You've got to start looking in the mirror and say, man, you a good looking dude right there now. Who, buddy, Holly's lucky. I mean, she gets all of this. Woohoo! Come on, guys, just try that. Look over to your bride. Just say, you get all of this, baby. <laughs> easy, sonny, easy. <laughs> Love others with who you are and who they are and the intrinsic value God has given you and them. Look, we all gain the most value from your life when you're the real you. Did you know you are uniquely created by God to be you? God has placed you, for those of you that this is your church, God has placed you in this body and we all need the unique intrinsic value that you bring to us. We need you. To withhold that or to put on a mask or to put on a facade or to try to be something you are not cheapens your value. You need to hear this. We don't need a cheap second rate you. We need the real you. When you are not yourself, it hurts the value God created you to display and the value for us to be blessed by. Look on the screen. God doesn't want you to be a second rate copy. He created you to be a first class you. Get comfortable in who you are. Look, not everybody's going to like you. That's okay. There's enough of us out there that will. Count the ones that do. Amen. It'll be all right. I promise you, when you're the real you and you go where God tells you to go, you will be accepted and loved and treated with respect and dignity, and we will value you. Man, somebody shout amen to that. Isn't it good? Isn't it, doesn't it feel good to be placed in the body as God sees fit? And when we have those gifts and those abilities, we need to use them for God. And I think the, the best place to start is the local church. Well, okay, pastor, where can I serve? Because I'm born to serve. I'm born to make a difference. Well, why serve in the local church? It's the best place to start. Psalm 84, 10 says it this way. A single day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. Man, isn't that true? I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God than live the good life in the homes of the wicked. Look, when you serve outside the church, you can be wicked, nasty, mean, and hateful. But when you serve in the local church, your attitude has to raise to another level. You got to get an attitude check at the door. Amen. Because this is all about God's kingdom. Number two, it reflects your love for others. I love what Galatians says here in the message. Chapter 5, verse 13 through 15. It is absolutely clear that God has called you to a free life. If you hear nothing else today, hear this. If you're bound by something, God's called you to a free life. Woo. Just make sure that you don't use this freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want to do and destroy your freedom. Watch, watch this. Rather, use your freedom to serve one another in love. That's how freedom grows. If you want more freedom in your life, serve more people. The more you serve, the more freedom you have. The more you serve, the more freedom you have. If all you do 
bondage, take, 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 you might still be in bondage. But when you serve in the local body, when you serve for the kingdom of God, when you serve Jesus Christ, the more you do, the more freedom you'll walk in. For everything we know about God's word is summed up in a single sentence. Love others as you love yourself. John the Revelator, did you know he lived in his 90s? They tried to kill him in boiling oil. They couldn't. His last five years, he didn't say much. But they said he said three words over and over and over. Love one another. Love one another. Love one another. Love one another. One of his last messages, like two months before he died, way in his 90s, they brought him into the church. They had all the highfalutins there, the early church fathers. They couldn't wait to hear what he was going to preach. He got up there and he said, love one another. <laughs> and he left. <laughs> Sermon's done. What a great word. Three words could change this world. Love one another. Three words could tear down the racial divide in our nation. Love one another. Three words could actually get rid of the Democrat versus Republican. Love one another. Three words could tear down all denominational lines in churches. Love one another. Somebody shout amen. This is an act of true freedom. If you bite and ravage one another, watch out. In no time at all, you'll be annihilating each other. And where will your precious freedom be then? You get freedom by showing love to others. We are representing Christ. And you never know what someone's dealing with when they walk through them doors. Multiple times in my ministry has somebody walked in these doors and they said, testified after they said, this was going to be my last time I was ever going to give God a shot. I've had people say I was going home and I was going to kill myself. God saved my life literally today. You don't know what's walking, somebody's walking through these doors, what their thought process is. Third, why serve in the local church? It's rewarding. Colossians 3, 23 through 24. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to who? The Lord and not to men. Knowing that from the Lord, you will receive the reward of the inheritance. You serve the Lord Christ. Hey, we'd love for you to serve, but listen, you're not doing this for Bridge of Hope Church or Pastor Dallas. You're doing this for Jesus. When you serve, you're doing it for Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. And if you've got gifts, talents, and abilities that you're not using for the Lord, it's no different than taking a five-carat diamond and throwing it in the drawer at home. It's useless. Use your gifts for God. It is to your benefit to serve the, the kingdom of God and to serve at church. It's kingdom building. Yes, it helps us, but it's to your benefit. You serve on the dream team because you have intrinsic value. Uno muno. A Spanish philosopher tells a story of the Roman aqueduct in Segovia in his native country of Spain. He said it was built in 109 AD. And that's some real stuff there. That's less than 100 years after Christ. For 1,800 years, it carried cool water to that dry and thirsty town. 1,800 years, 60 generations of people got fresh drinking water from this Roman aqueduct. The Romans had it going on when it came to that. Then came another generation. <laughs> they said, well, the aqueduct is a great marvel and it needs to be preserved for our children. It's a museum piece. We're going to relieve it of its centuries-long labor. They did. They laid modern iron pipes. They gave the ancient bricks and mortar a reverent rest. And in so doing, <laughs> the aqueduct, which had brought cool, fresh drinking water to this city in Spain for 1,800 years, began to fall apart. Because what they didn't realize was when they didn't have that cool, fresh water running through it, what do you think happened when that hot sun beat on that mortar? It began to dry and crack and fall apart until finally the brick and stone sagged and threatened to fall and they had to do something very quickly. Here's what Unamuno said. What ages of service could not destroy, idleness disintegrated. What ages of service 
could not destroy. Idleness disintegrated in one generation. And finally, the jeweler sets the ring in place, and this is my favorite part of the whole message. With a third specific goal in mind, one is to let the best light of the, shine, uh, uh, of the stone shine forth. Secondly, to protect it. But then number three, the jeweler sets the stone in such a way to cover its imperfection. Number three, point three, God wants to cover your imperfection. Jesus came and stepped into our imperfection. God loves us so much, watch this, that he's placed people around you to step into your imperfections and help complete you. How many of you married your opposite? God didn't do that as a cruel joke. God put your spouse in your life to cover your imperfections. God said, Dallas, you got, you got a whole lot. Dude, I'm going to have to give you a holly. <laughs> you need a lot of help. <laughs> you got, we need, a matter of fact, she ain't going to be good enough on her own to do it, so we're going to have to give you a whole church. <laughs> you need lots of help. You just think pastors are here to lead the church. God says, no, they're the dummies that need all the help. We're going to give him a whole lot of people to help them. They cover you. 1 Peter 4, 8, watch this. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Love people in spite of their behavior. Love people simply because of their intrinsic value. Verse 18, 1 Corinthians 12, watch. But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them. Poke your neighbor and say, that's you. I'm almost done. Just as he wanted them to be. Wow. God placed the believers as he sees fit. This is a jeweler's term again where he is placing or setting a stone and ring. The only time in the whole Bible that it's mentioned this way. 1 Corinthians 12, 11. All these are the work of one and the same spirit and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Folks, that's why you don't church hop. That's why you get planted in a church body and you stay until God leads you elsewhere. Because you can get yourself out of place very quickly. And here, when God sets you in the right place, he's setting you there because the body needs you, but you also need the body to cover your imperfections. You see, it's a, it's a two-way thing here. So when you run off somewhere when God isn't the one leading, it's going to expose your imperfections. God in his infinite wisdom says, well, I need some of you at Bridge of Hope Church. So you need to hang out because you're going to bring value to them. But guess what? They're all going to cover you as well. Man, isn't, isn't, that, isn't God just brilliant? Yes. Holly had an engagement ring one time. And it had a little mar, a little, a little, little not crack, but a little mar in the diamond. And it was down on the side. And the jeweler told us, Steve Cope, he said, here's what we're going to do. He said, we're going to line up that little mar with the prong on the ring so it covers and hides the imperfection of the stone. That's what God does with you and I. He says, Dale Cain, you got some imperfections. So I'm going to line you up at Bridge of Hope Church and they're going to cover your imperfections. He is such a perfect gentleman. He says, I'm going to set you up. Listen, this is amazing and we're going to pray. He says, I'm going to set you up so your best light shines, so you're secure and protected and so your imperfections are hidden. That's what it means to be in the body of Christ. Can it get any better than that? I've got a little prayer I'd like for us to pray and then we're going to ask anybody that wants to come down and just pray a minute. But I'd like for everybody to look at the screen. I'd like for you just to pray this with me. I'll, I'll lead it. Is it on the screen? It is. All right. One, two, three. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I ask you to forgive me for doubting the value I have. 
I repent for looking through the wrong lens in life. I command the spirit of fear and timidity to leave my life. I command self-doubt to leave in Jesus' name. I ask you to fill me with the realization of who I am in Christ. I am a child of God. I am the head and not the tail. I am above only and not beneath. I have incredible intrinsic value. I surrender to your will and your word, Lord. I ask you to let my best light shine forth. Protect me and cover my imperfections. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give Jesus a hand clap of praise? With that note, I think they're going to lead us in a little song here. But before we do, or while they're getting ready here, I'm going to ask you to just find a spot if you're comfortable down at this altar. Just find a spot to come down here. And I want you just to think about your role, what you have to offer, the things that you can do. I want you to think about your best light shining forth. That's what God's trying to do. He's a perfect gentleman. He'll never embarrass you. He'll never try to, to, to hoodwink you. He's trying to let your best light shine, cover your imperfections, and keep you secure and protected. And I want you, every one of you, have such incredible value. In fact, I feel a call for anybody that may be feeling with self-doubt and those things. We just prayed that. But I want to ask everybody, would you stand to your feet? We're going to be dismissed here in just a moment. But before we are, I want to invite you to come down to this altar. Just lay your life down at the altar. If you can't physically kneel down and pray, maybe just make the front pew area, the front chairs as a way of saying, God, I'm yours. Maybe just come and worship. Come and bless the name of the Lord. You're born to serve. You're born to make a difference. God's protecting you. God's covering you. God's letting your best light shine. Glory to his name. Come on, everybody, just come. Find a 